thanks a lot, and it's great to be here, finally at the conference. I mean, the organizer already started to run the conference in 2020, and we all know what happened then, and then they tried it again in 2021, and we all know that it kept on, and now it's 2022, and it finally made it, so I'm really glad that eventually the conference came to life. And I'm here, unfortunately, Stefan Todt wasn't able to make it, and so I tried to fill in. I'm, I'm not Stefan, of course, but I hope I will have a few interesting ideas for you, too. And Randy asked the question in his keynote, what is the problem we try to solve? And I think it's a great question, and we should ask it very often. I will try to even go one step back further and ask the question, why are we doing architectural work at all? And um, you might ask yourself now, why is he raising such a fundamental question? So why don't you give us some concrete advice or something like that? And the point is that I see lots of discussions going on about architecture and architectural work, not only in the HR community, everywhere, but usually all these discussions revolve around what should we do, how should we do it, when should we do it, how much should we do, and so on. Unfortunately, the people forgot the most important question. Why are we doing it? And due to that, quite often these discussions are merely habits, ceremony, beliefs, opinions, and stuff like that. But they lack direction, some foundation. And what I will try to do in the next 35 minutes or so is to give you some ideas which will help you to make up your own mind. And when you go to the next discussion, see, oh, that really makes sense, or... No, that's just an opinion. Let's forget about that one. So, let's see how it works. My name is Uwe Friedrichsen. I work for a nice little company called Codecentric. I think we're not that small anymore, but I think we're still nice. Um, yeah. And you will find me on most social media and other places in the internet with my handle Ufried, so at Twitter, speaker deck, or also on my own blog and so on. And in case you missed that, if you want to ask some questions via Slido, here is the QR code again. So I will stand here still for another five seconds and then move on. All right, don't see any smartphones trying to make a picture. So we can start with a question. Why are we doing architectural work? I already said there's a problem in the discussions we do if we don't ask the question why. And there's a lot more bad things that are going to happen if we don't ask why. So if we do architectural work without why, we see a lot of bad things going on in the community like this. Agile architecture, where or I also call it naive architecture. Yeah, it's all emergent, so we just do some TDD and everything will be fine, and let's kill all architects, by the way. So some agile misunderstandings. On the other hand, we see these extremists say, no, big design up front, is it? So don't touch that keyboard before I finished my last diagram over here. Or we also see the Stack Overflow, a Google-driven architecture. Hey, why is this architect like this? Oh, I've seen it last conference, that's how we do things now. And or the other guys who say, no, 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 architecture, that's a strategic thing. Here's a big development plan, and I will only talk to the CTO, I don't talk to you over here. And the worst thing probably we've seen is this architect as a step on the career ladder, so developer, architect, manager, which doesn't make any sense to me at all, because, I mean, you can be a great developer, and you suck as an architect or a manager. You can be a great architect, but you suck in the other two disciplines, or you can be a great manager, and so on. It's three very different skill sets. I have no idea at all why they mix them up in a career ladder, and so on. And it all happens because we forgot to ask, why the heck are we doing the whole thing? So, let's ask it, because to focus our action, to really know what we're doing, we need to ask why. So without asking why, what we're doing will be local optimizations 
in a vacuum, so the value will be mostly accidental. I mean, you can also go to a lot of companies and you see, oh, there are all these dysfunctionalities. These dysfunctionalities usually happen not only because they're mean people, evil people, Machiavellists who try to make their career and stuff like that. Yeah, we have some of them, but most people simply try to do their job without knowing why they're doing it in the first place. And so they're trying to locally optimize it. And the same thing is true for architectural work. So let's try to reestablish our focus. Why are we doing architectural work? I'm going to offer you three perspectives which complement each other. Let's start with the first one. First one is, bottom line is, yeah, we need to do architectural work to address an optimization problem over time within changing constraints. Obvious, isn't it? Well, sure, no. <laughs> And by the way, if you want to have some mean fun, try that in a meeting somewhere, especially in bigger enterprises, and everybody will be sitting, yeah, 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 yeah. And nobody will have a clue what you just said, but nobody dares to ask you, what the heck did you just say? And if it makes any sense, but only if you're in some kind of evil mood. Otherwise, don't do that. Okay, but let me unpack that sentence a little bit, statement. I mean, if you went into architecture work a little bit, we know we try to satisfy these quality attributes, these illities, these non-functional requirements, however you name it. I don't like the name non-functional requirements because it's a little bit misleading quality attributes, some properties that your solution should exhibit. And there are a lot of them. We've seen some on Randy's slides. Here's some more. And there are even more than just these ones. There are some collections like the ISO 2510 standard or the predecessor, the 9126, or Software Engineering Institute also had some lists. There's not the list. There are just some lists, but some of them will be more important in your project than other ones. Of course, the ISO guys always insist that they have the authoritative list, but let them keep their belief. <laughs> anyway. The interesting thing, if you look at these attributes, is that you can separate them into two classes which exhibit very different properties. One class of the attributes addresses development time, development built and tests, so they're development-related attributes, changeability, maintainability, evolvability. And the other part, addresses runtime-related attributes, availability, scalability, performance, and all these things. So they address how the system op uh, behaves at runtime, so operations and usage. Um, some people also split that up in three classes, uh, development, usage, and operations, but for the sake of this talk, two classes are enough. And I've seen quite interesting discussions between people because one person was relating to the one type and the other person related to the other type. And so they had strange discussions. So let's have a quick look at these two types. Development-related attributes. They describe the desired behavior of a system from development perspective. So they influence how efficiently and effectively, the system can be modified, as I said, modified. So, evolvability, changeability, maintainability. So they target the cost of change, basically. And, very important thing, just a tiny little problem with those. The effectiveness, if you do anything to improve one of those, the effectiveness of your measure can only be measured in hindsight. So, you have two options to improve something. Now, which is the right one? Which is the better one? So, to know that, you would need to know all future change requests targeting this one system. Because, I mean, changeability is great, but change with respect to what? To the change, to the future change request to that of that system. If you add some changeability or modifiability or availability over here, and this part will never be changed again in the future, in the end, it's, it's been waste. So nobody needed that kind of flexibility. If you forgot 
to add some changeability measures over there, and this part will be changed over and over again, well, you will pay several times for that, because changing stuff later is usually a lot more expensive than immediately building it in. So the problem is, well, you have no clue what the future change request for this one system will be. And even if you would know, basically what you would have to do is then to split up your timeline into two timelines, so the Marvel multiverse basically creating one of those, say, okay, over here we apply that one, over here we apply the other measure, and now we apply all the change requests until end of life of the system, then we draw a line, calculate the cost up, oh, that one would have been a better one. Unfortunately, Physics are not that advanced yet that we can do time travel and split universes and timelines and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's mostly some kind of advanced guesswork what we're doing here. So there are some heuristics which are quite useful and we should apply them. We can have a limited look into the future, but it's quite limited. So we have no clue what's really going on five years from now or 10 years from now. And often these systems live for 20, 30 years or longer. So, and yeah, as a result of that, we see a lot of heated debates about what to do here and lots of strong opinions and beliefs and all that stuff. Unfortunately, not that often really good profound knowledge or something like that. Still, that's the optimization problem over time. So we try to optimize the cost of change in terms of that we try to reduce or improve the probability that future changes can be implemented easily without overspending right now. Runtime-related attributes, on the other hand, are very different from that. So they describe the desired behavior of the system at runtime from a usage and operations point of view. So it's more about correctness. So 99% of all requests come back within 300 milliseconds performance um, requirement or performance quality uh, attribute. Or something like, yeah, the system is available in 99.9% of the time. Yeah, it's quite straightforward. I mean, we don't know it exactly at the moment when we implement that, but we can implement it, release it, measure, and we see if we're in or we're out. It's quite straightforward. There's not a lot of guesswork. So maybe we have to come back to that and refine it later because we figured out, oh, it's 350 milliseconds, so let's improve that a little bit. But it's quite straightforward. We don't have to travel through time or split the universe or anything like that to figure out what's going on there. So these attributes constrain our solution options, basically. And they can help us to support our evaluation process. So here we have two options to implement that. And uh, yeah, that option over there responds in 500 milliseconds in average, so probably not suited. So let's cross that out and move on with that one, because that satisfies the goal. 99%, 300 milliseconds, that's fine. <clears throat> one last thing you have to keep in mind here is that these constraints may change over time. I mean, something which is true in the beginning may change over time. Business requirements may change. You may get different users groups that you need to address. You may get technological advantages. Your infrastructure landscape changes, so integrations will change, and, and, and. There are a lot of things going on which might influence these attributes that you will need to change them over time. These were the changing constraints I talked about. So going back to that image, that's the cost of change-related attributes, and that's the correctness of behavior-related attributes. And now we would be ready for our first, to rephrase that first idea. Just one thing is missing. The problem is that cost of change is not sufficient. To give you an example, I once heard about a project team that was going to introduce Kafka to their solution. I said, well, that's a bit strange because that customer 
they have quite small IT department and usually they just run some kind of standard software and desktop systems and so on. And that's basically it. So the solution they're creating is quite a big deal for them already. And then Kafka, and I went to them and said, well, um, am I right that you're introducing Kafka to a solution? Yeah, yeah, we did, we did, we did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and why are you doing that? Yeah, uh, we have some requirements with events and so on. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, but these events are coming from the fire hose, aren't they? So that you're using Kafka. No, 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 that's not a lot of events that we have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, just a f one or two per minute or something like that. Mm. You already have a relational database down there. Why don't you implement that with a relational database that you have down there? And just make a table which acts like a queue. No problem to do that. Oh, you know, it, with all the nice ecosystem and the libraries and so on, we could implement the solution within half a day with Kafka and it would have taken us four days with the other one. And you know, we're a little bit in hurry and so we took Kafka. So, well, did you ever consider the runtime related consequences of your choice? Uh, why? Does the customer already run Kafka? No, no, they don't. So they have to introduce it. Yeah, 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 they have to. Yeah, well, um, so they have to hire new staff because the staff they're already having have no clue how to run Kafka. So they have to hire new people if they get the new people. Admins 24-7, new people, okay. And they have to pay licenses because they want to have monitoring on Kafka because 24-7, you know, it, it needs to be up and running, the stuff. And they have to run additional infrastructure and all that stuff. And so you just added about half a million bucks per year to their bill for saving three and a half days. Oh, we never thought about it that way. Well, yeah. They figured out a different solution later after the discussion. So, had a good ending. Still, these decisions happen often if you only take development tests into account. I've seen lots of these situations. And there are a lot of other costs. I mean, there are not development maintenance costs only, there are test costs, there are deployment costs, there are operations costs, there are administration costs, there are training costs, there are usage costs, there are license costs, and, 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 and. And you need to take all of these cost types into account if you want to come up with a good solution. Unfortunately, the quality attributes don't cover that part. All right, but cumulative costs, not only cost of change. It's important here. With that, we can rephrase the original statement, that cryptic one. Why do we need architecture and do architectural work? We try to minimize the cumulative costs of a system over its lifetime, while at the same time ensuring its correctness of behavior at runtime. So this not violating any of the runtime properties. That's what we try to do, basically. That's what we should try to achieve with architectural work. And you can use that quite often and say, okay, there comes someone around and says, that's how you have to do architecture. And you can look at that and say, well, does it support that? Does it help to optimize the costs? No, oh, maybe it's just habit or ceremony or belief or something like, oh, yeah, it really does it, yeah. Cool thing. So in the next what or why discussion, uh, in the what or how discussion, for me at least, that was very helpful. What I said, three perspectives. Well, that first one was, I think is quite usable to really, or it's quite actionable, so you can quite straightforward use that to say, does it support me? Doesn't it support me? Is it really architectural work or is it something else, what we're talking about? I miss the humans in there a little bit. So it's a quite technocratic definition. So let's add the humans into the picture because in the end, IT is people business. It's not computer business. That's a lie. It's people business in the end. It's all about humans. What are we trying to achieve? We have a problem domain, context, needs, constraints, requirements, all that stuff. And we try to shape a solution from these requirements, constraints, and all that stuff in our solution domain. And ideally, 
as a direct mapping. These four requirements over there and three, these three constraints add to this piece of software over there. There's just a tiny little problem with that. Typical real-world solutions are big. Lots of details over here. Thousands, billions. Lots of details over there. Also thousands and billions. And if you still try to figure out which pieces are interrelated over here and on which pieces over there they depend, if you have a million here and a million there, good luck with that. Your brain will, be exp will explode. So too much cognitive load. Direct mapping doesn't work anymore. So what we're trying to do in such situations is we try to create some kind of order and structure which helps us to get from here to there. And that's the second idea of architecture, architectural work. We try to condense and structure all these requirements and needs and context and constraints and all that stuff over here in some way and apply a little bit of structure here that we can use as a guidance orientation over here. Oh, I've got a problem to solve over here. Yeah, okay, it relates to these three pieces over there and it is influenced by these requirements here and also we have to satisfy these five constraints over there. And now it fits your brain. Oh, it's nice, it, it helps you. So, <clears throat> to rephrase that in a little bit different way, so architecture work should be about condensing and structuring the needs and demands of your problem domain. In a way, it, you created an architecture that provides guidance and orientation in creating a solution because it should reduce the cognitive load of the people creating the solution. Developers. We typically use these views, which are not necessarily diagrams, also can be interface, whatever. It requires structured behavior and guiding principles, constraints, all, all these things. So, what, so, however, we document that and discuss that and bring it over, across. And you can also use that one. See, I mean, maybe you have seen these kind of show off developers. Quite often male developers, not so often female developers, try to say, hey, I can create the boldest solution. See me weaving together 10 frameworks in just 10 minutes to create, to save three lines of code. And when I implemented the stuff, only I and God knew what I did. Three months later, only God knows. So these hero developers, show of implementation. We also see that sometimes with architects, the same way. So these show of solutions, I call them architecture porn, basically. Um, so moving on, saying, hey, look here, what cool and overly complex architecture. See how brilliant I am. Well, not brilliant, useless. Throw it away, come up with something easier. So if the architecture doesn't have to reduce cognitive load, Rethink it. I mean, there may be some kind of learning curve in the beginning, but overall, it needs to support developers in reducing their cognitive load. Otherwise, it's a bad architecture. And last perspective before wrapping up. When I thought about that, I said, yeah, humans, but that's just one stakeholder group, a developer. It's a very important stakeholder group, but it's just one. Is there anything for the other stakeholder group? Is there anything in it, in architectural work? And interestingly, I got an inspiration from somewhere outside the IT domain. I watched documentation about a famous interior designer was Ilse Crawford. She does great work. And very often you get some inspirations when you watch something which is outside your domain and you try to apply these ideas and insights from those domains to your domain. And say, does that work? And she had a very nice statement which she, which she made. Which she made. Sorry, too early. Not enough coffee. She said, ultimately, Design is a tool to enhance our humanity. 
And that somehow resonated with me. Could architecture be something which helps us to make the lives of the people involved affected by our systems better? And I think it should. I mean, if you go back to these quality attributes and think about that, good performance makes life of users better. Availability, same thing. Testability makes life of testers better and developers better. Maintainability, changeability makes life of developers better. Operatability, um, observability makes life of, uh, of the operations folks better. And the costs make lives of people in charge of product management, so the flexibility makes lives of the product department better, and so on. So a good architecture should help you to make life of the people involved better in the end. Even the cost optimization. I mean, if you don't waste lots of money for useless stuff, you have the money to make something useful with that. We all know it doesn't always happen in companies. If they have more money, not necessarily they do something useful. With it. But if we waste the money, we definitely don't have it. We can't do anything useful with it. So, I think it's a good way to reflect your architecture in a way and say, well, does it make life of the people involved better or worse? If it makes life worse, maybe we're on the wrong track. No, not maybe. We are on the wrong track. If it makes life worse, it should improve our lives. And so to wrap up these ideas, we need architecture to minimize the cumulative costs without co violating correctness. That's quite useful to really figuring out, is it architectural work or is it just belief or routine or habit or anything like that? Very useful, at least for me, to figure that out. To reduce cognitive load, to make sure, is it a show of architecture or is it really an architecture? And the last thing, it's about humans. In the end, it should be all about humans. And it's quite a nice complementing litmus test for that. And I think with those three ideas, with those three perspectives which complement each other, I hope I gave you a little bit of a framework which helps you to make up your own mind in the next discussion about architectural work. Is it useful? Does it help humans? Or is it something else we can throw away, discard. So, thanks a lot for your time and attention, and now I'm ready to take questions. Thank you so much, people front and center of our software architecture. I love this message. Um, we don't have any questions in the queue, unless the, 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 the tool yeah happens to have a downtime. There's one. Look at this one. <laughs> what is the smallest element of software development in need for architecture? Oof. Well, it depends. <laughs> that, there's that bad answer again. Um, it can be a single line of code, actually. Um, but it's not always that way. I mean, sometimes you're within the constraint of implementing some kind of business logic and you already met all the constraints and so on. And it's just business logic. Probably the architectural concerns do not bother you so much. But as soon as you're integrating with some other parts of the code or making sure that things run smoothly in production and so on, it most definitely is important. I mean, there's so many things that can be relevant in terms of availability, so fault tolerance and all these things that come into play, and especially performance, runtime behavior, and so on. I mean, I've seen so many people creating batch systems by running online transactions a million times, which is a very, very bad idea. I've seen systems going from, three hour, from an hour on the mainframe to 72 hours on big servers, 
just because they rearranged the logic and all that stupid. So it can be quite small, basically. The most important thing is, um, if you think about architectural documentation, is that you don't overload it. So it's more about guiding principles and a few constraints that you can have in mind. Again, cognitive load. I hope, again, let's discuss that in a coffee if you have a more specific questions in there, and then we'll figure out. Um, we've got more questions in coming. Let's take the first one. First one, how do you estimate the cost of change in the different architectures? <laughs> That's a mean one. <laughs> um, as I said, it's about probabilities. There's not a definite answer. What you can do is something like, you know a little bit about the change requirements for the next few months. You can look into the business domain. How do things work together in the business? And which makes sure which is highly cohesive and which is just loosely coupled in the business domain. You can look into, uh, you can ask, have interviews with business experts and so on. You can look into the typical, uh, into the internet. What's going on in the domain, basically? Are there any trends and so on? And basically, that's what helps me not exactly to estimate the cost, but to figure out what is more likely to change in the future and what is less likely to change in the future. And I try to use these as a few heuristics which guide me through picking options and solutions. Again, it's about probability, so you can put a number on that, but, well, let's be honest, it will be a guess. And we've got one more here highlighted. Um, how do you handle architecture in your company? Have a group of architects as gatekeepers, use specs? Uh, so, I'm working for a consulting company, so we have people and projects, and I sometimes help them, give them advice, and so on. So if I'm in the project, for sure, I try. Especially, what I personally try to do is not to go around and say, you do it like that. I try to have a discussion with the people and say, well, like the example I gave you, well, you introduced Kafka, and why did you do that? And try to help them figure out the pros and cons of their ideas and so on. Um, if you're in a product company, it's a different game, basically. So then, I think a community of practice is something useful, but probably it's a better idea to go over to Randy at a coffee and ask him this question, because he worked in product companies for almost all his career, and I worked as a consultant almost all my career, so probably my answer would be a bad fit for a product company. Sorry about that. <laughs> and we've got yeah. one more question. One more. What techniques do you use to figure out if a change makes life of user easier? <laughs> I don't have a clear answer about that, to be honest. It's, it's a bit of gut feeling, it's a bit of discussion, it's a bit of trying to feel how it resonates. So, and what aids me most of the time is I try to act, I'm not sure how to translate it best, a sort of a humble architect. So I don't try to dominate people and push things on there. I try to work with the feedback from the people and discuss with them, figure out what works for them, what doesn't work for them, what makes their life hard, and so on, and figure out solutions which works good for them. I'm not always great at that, so I also suck sometimes, as every one of us does, but, but at least I try. And so, again, it's people business. It's about relations, it's about correlations, it's about responding to the vibes a little bit. So there's not the clear technique, okay, here are the three measures, and now we're happy. <laughs> Sorry for not being more concrete on that one, but I try to be honest. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. The QSM team, and I think we've deserved a longer break now. Thank you so much once again, and applause for Uwe.